All right, we're ready for 1 Timothy chapter 6 in our survey of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. So let's see where we've been and where we're going. Let's review where we've been, our first five chapters. Chapter 1, what's it about? All right, yes. Paul charged Timothy concerning the sound doctrine. Here is the sound doctrine, teach no other doctrine. You tell others to teach no other doctrine. Chapter 2. Very good. Chapter 2 is dealing with instructions to men and women. Chapter 3. Qualifications of elders and deacons. Chapter 4. All right, yes, personal instructions to Timothy. And then last week, chapter 5. Yeah, various groups that are uh, addressed in chapter 5. This is the outline we've been following. This is the last time we'll see. This is from Don DeWelt. We mentioned several times there's probably some improvement that could be made, but it's not a bad outline. Chapter 6, the first part, as he classifies it, deals with the care of the members of the church, but the bulk of it deals with the minister himself. That is, Paul's instructions to Timothy as a preacher of the gospel, here's what you teach, here's what you say, here's how you conduct yourself. We're going to see several of those instructions as we go further. So here is our outline of chapter 6. I call the chapter False Teachers, Riches, and some Final Exhortations to Timothy. And so this is just some miscellaneous information to Timothy, beginning with uh, what, ser- what he needs to teach about servants, what they should and should not do. False teachers, warning about false teachers, 3 to 5. He talks about contentment versus riches, or contentment and riches, verses 6 to 10. And then the next section I call exhortation to Timothy, of what he's to do. He's to flee, he's to follow, he's to fight. And some would add even to keep in that and subdivide that last section. We'll say more about that when we get there. 17 to 19 is the exhortation to the rich. It's interesting that he picks up on riches a a second time, uh, having already identified that earlier. And then here's the final charge, and that is to keep that which is committed and avoid some things. So we've got some ground to cover, only 21 verses, but um, that's chapter 6. Let's go to our questions now and get question number 1. What does Paul say servants should do? All right, make sure your actions do not blaspheme God. Anything else? Count them worthy of honor, and they are worthy of respect and honor, though they may not even be children of God. In fact, it's implied in verse 1, they were not. There would be some who are, verse 2. We'll get to that here in a moment. All right, let's work our way through verses 1 and 2. I have two points, subpoints in that. Servants are to honor their masters and do their master's service. Uh, let many, as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Now notice the next phrase, so that the name of God and his doctrine should not be blasphemed. Now this is in a day of, of master-slave relationships. And as a footnote to that, I would add... Uh, and, and listen to this carefully and not misquote this. The New Testament never specifically and directly addresses the question of slavery, but in principle it abolishes it. Would you agree? How so? That if masters and slaves both follow, you finish my sentence when you can, when masters and slaves both follow the will of God, there will basically be no, no animosity, no master-slave relationship as we think of them. In other words, even, uh, for example, in Philemon, was, did Paul not send a slave back to his master? Instead of telling him, run away, keep fleeing, and get away, you get your freedom, go. Didn't do that, he sent him back. Told him, and... and the master was to treat his slave properly. The slave is to treat his master properly. But what the New Testament does is obliterate it basically by the master is to treat his slave right and the slave was to treat his master right and it ends up being not much more than what we would have in an employee and employer relationship. Does that make sense? In respect. 
Would you agree that verses 1 and 2 apply to us today even though we're not in a master-slave relationship? There's no one that owns you, uh, but you may work for someone. Would it apply? Why? All right, good point. Absolutely. Let's look at verse 1. I want want to go back and drive this point home. And that is, putting this in a modern setting, whether it's a master-slave, apply it there if you wish, or if it's an employee-employer relationship, that as many servants count their their masters, or count, um, I've lost my place. It's hard to do that with one verse, isn't it? Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. So first of all, you are to respect and honor those that are over you. Would you agree with that? That's conditional only if they're what they ought to be, right? No, why? Why'd you say that? Yeah, honor all masters. Doesn't matter who they are. That's right. So number one, show respect and honor. Uh, like honor the king, First Peter 2 and 17. And that was under Nero. That was a wicked emperor. But honor the king, show respect. But here's what I'm really driving at. Uh, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not, should not be blasphemed. How does that relate to what you are in the employee-employer relationship? Okay, all right. Anything else? That's good. Yeah, the way you conduct yourself on the job has everything to do with their impression of Christianity. You tell them you're a Christian, I go to church, I'm a member over here at El Bethel Church of Christ, and uh, I invite you to come with me, but how you conducted yourself in your relationship to your employer or employee for that matter, or fellow employees has everything to do with their impression of God. Now, verse 2 goes further to say, and those who have believing masters, in other words, your master may be a fellow Christian, let him not despise them because they're brethren. What does that mean? Yeah, don't re- good point. But don't resent him that he has authority over you just because he's your brother. Um, much like a family relationship, honor the the position that he's in. But rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. And then Paul tells Timothy, well, let's, before we get the last phrase, what does he mean by that? Because they are benefited. In other words, if you if you're working for a Christian. Don't resent that, but it would be the opposite. Finish that sentence. I'm so, say again. Be thankful for it because the one you're serving is a fellow Christian and they're being benefited. A Christian is being benefited by your service, especially. And then Paul tells Timothy, teach and exhort these things. This is some, something you need to teach on. How people conduct themselves as masters and slaves conduct themselves on the job, et cetera. Make sense? Good point. Good point. All right, let's go to question number two. Question number two is, what does Paul say about false teachers? All right, have nothing to do with them. Shun them and rebuke them. We'll come back to that. I'll say more about that in a moment. What else? Three to five. All right. If they're teaching, which false teachers are, things contrary to God, they're proud, and they don't know what they think they know. Good point, yes. Uh, They're not that hard to identify. 
um, if we have some knowledge. That's a good point. Yes, they are. They're contrary to the will of God. Three things here I want to point out. Verse 3, their teaching is contrary to the doctrine of Christ. If anyone teaches otherwise, that is contrary to the doctrine, and does not consent to wholesome words. What are wholesome words? Yeah, these are the words that came from God. Some translations use the expression sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. We talk about sound doctrine. Sound has to do, it's, it's a medical term having to do with that which is wholesome and healthy. So here is doctrine that is true, is wholesome and healthy. False doctrine is, it's unhealthy, spiritually, yes. Uh, so if anyone teaches contrary and they don't consent to sound doctrine, the wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what sound doctrine, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, then here's his characteristics. So first of all, they teach things contrary to the doctrine. Secondly, their characteristics are what? You tell me, verse 4. If you're contrary to the doctrine and go deliberately contrary to the doctrine, you're, you're proud, first of all. You're arrogant. You think you're smarter than God. Secondly, they know nothing. They don't know what they think they know. Perhaps, let me just add a footnote here. Perhaps he's referring to the same kind of thing that he's referring to down at verse 20, which if you remember a few weeks back, we dealt with Gnosticism in light of 1 Timothy, and it may have reference to the Gnostic thought, uh, that they do not have the knowledge they think they have. They claim to have superior knowledge. Uh, but to say the least, a false teacher doesn't know what he thinks he knows. If he's teaching error, he's, he doesn't know what he thinks he knows. Uh, what else do we see? Verse 4. All right. Yes, There's, they're, they're obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. We've already come across in 1 Timothy those who would argue over genealogies. And they were the old wives' fables, and we've identified those. Uh, some of that may be Jewish in origin. Others have suggested that may be Gnostic uh, uh, concepts. Uh, but whatever it may be, here's something contrary to the re revelation of God. And when, when they want to argue and dispute over things, that when you get through, doesn't lead you to any greater knowledge of the scriptures, here's what it does. And so, he, uh, and, and before we get list what it does, here's one of the things I point out in preacher training programs constantly to young men, and that is don't waste your time on useless material. That's good, that's good advice for Bible class teachers, isn't it? And that's good advice for preachers. Don't, when you're in the pulpit, when you're in a classroom, don't waste time on useless material. Here's why. You tell me, verse 4. From that comes, it generates envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. Let's talk about those. Uh, yes, sir. I think so. I think there are those who do that. There have been some who've admitted that. Uh, that they, uh, back there, as an illustration of that, back during institutional days, uh, there were the guys who admitted that I'm going to see which way the, the, the thing goes, where the majority goes, where I want to be used among brethren. I want to be brethren to use me in meetings. I want to have places to preach. So they stick their finger to the wind, and that's the way they're going. That's the way I'm going. Uh, there was one brother, and I won't quote him, but uh, if I mentioned his name, you would have heard of him, uh, who went to Texas to try out during the institutional days, and it was, the report was when the brethren asked him, which side did he stand on, and they, uh, he responded by saying, which side do you need me on? <laughs> In other words, I'll go whichever way you want me to go. If y'all want me to go that way, I can go that way. Well, then, needless to say, he wasn't worth his weight and salt. But I think you're right about that. But notice here's what it generates. It can generate envy and strife. The word for strife uh, simply means contention or wrangling. The word for reviling is the word for blaspheme, uh, defaming man, defaming God, defaming uh, others, um, and evil suspicion. It makes one, uh, 
because of the arguments over things that amount to nothing, if someone doesn't agree with you, then you are suspicious, perhaps, of them uh, holding to evil concepts or, or guilty of evil things. So the point I want you to see is that when we waste our time on useless material, it generates nothing good but only harm. Does that make sense? Verse 5, here's, continuing his list, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. What's useless wranglings? All right, constant friction. A yeah, footnote in the New King James will say constant friction. Constant friction, taking the other phrase, putting them together, is something that's useless. It's not productive of good. It comes from men that have a corrupt mind and are destitute of the truth. Now, this is interesting at verse 5. Who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, and from such withdraw yourself. Let's look at two things. What does it mean that they suppose that godliness is a means of gain? This is not true of all false teachers, but particularly those that Paul may be addressing. All right. There's perhaps two things in mind here. One of two things and maybe a little of both. I'll start with with the idea that some think that if they are blessed, that that is uh, God's stamp of approval upon them. So I'm teaching this doctrine, I seem to be blessed, God is approving of what I say. And so uh, gain is, is a proof of my godliness. So I know I'm teaching the truth because I'm teaching baptism is not essential and I'm well blessed and I'm well supported, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's evidence that I'm right. That's may be partly involved, it seems to be more the idea that they use their, and I put in quotations, their godliness, they're not truly godly if they're false teachers, but they use what they view as their godliness as a means of gaining. In other words, I can teach this doctrine, let me give you an example, modern day. Um, the health and wealth gospel preachers are the televangelists, just all of them, let's just group them all together. That is, they preach and teach on television and beg for money, most of them end up being mega wealthy. They're using their brand of religion, brand of godliness, as a means of gain. Make sense? Could that happen on a, on a smaller scale, even in the church? There's, and I won't mention a country, but there have been a number of times we get requests for support from some foreign country, and when we inquire of brethren that we have confidence in, is this brother sound that's saying, no, he's a... He is a false teacher, he's ungodly, but he poses as a faithful preacher and he's getting support from churches in America. So his brand of godliness that he puts out in front is a means of gain, supported quite well for being a corrupt guy. All right, make sense? Now, at the end of that, before we go further, and then we're going to pick up our pace a little bit, at verse 5, what does he say Paul or uh, Timothy is to do about this? Here are false teachers... They're corrupt, they create problems. Here's what you need to do. What does he say? What does that mean? Separate himself from them. Why? You're right. You're exactly right. Why? He didn't have a bad influence. And you associate with them, you may have a little less leverage leverage the whole world. Otherwise, it spreads. You're you're exactly right. Tell me, if, let me, let me pose what really happens among brethren, and you tell me if this is fair. When, when someone wants to know, is John Doe, is he, is he a sound gospel preacher? And I inquire of some brethren that I know, and they may say, well, I don't know what he teaches, but let me tell you who his close associates and who he runs with and who he has for meetings where he is, and they name some corrupt guys that teach error. And so he runs with that crowd. And so I conclude that he probably is part of that crowd. I don't know for sure. Is that a fair assessment? You become like this. Say again? You become, like you become like them. Here's the point that I want you to see is be careful who you run with. Be careful of the crowd you run with. Be careful of those that you identify yourself with because you can become part of them or at least identified with them. Whether that's fair or not, you become identified with those who are your associates. All right, let's move on. Let's go to verses 6 to 10. 
And uh, let's go to question number three. What is the root of all evil? Love of money. Not money. Love of money is the root of all evil. So that leads us to question four. How is it the root of all evil? Okay. Uh, there is other evils besides dealing with authoritative titles. Right. Uh, you, you might, you might uh, covet after somebody else's wife. That has nothing to do with money. Right. That is, but that, that is evil and it's sinful. So there's other sins, I think, besides money, but people think that they can gain everything yeah. by, by the gain of money. Right. I think the point of the text is this, um, that not that money is the root of every sin, because there's some sins that don't involve money at all. Again, man lusts and he seizes, and whether it's, uh, um, you know, maybe he covets another man's wife and he may lose money over that, but that's still what he wants. There's no money involved. I got that. Um, so it doesn't mean that every sin, but it means every kind of sin. For example, uh, it's a mo money has a motive for some people stealing. Money is a motive for people gambling. Sometimes it's a motive for murder. Sometimes it's a motive for false doctrine, as we've already noted in the context, or some form of immorality. Uh, is, so money is at the heart of all kinds of evil. That's the point he's making. It's not saying every evil thing, money's tied to that, but all kinds of evil is the point. Yes, it can. Sometimes our lack of attendance may be because of money. I've got to have that, I, I'm going to volunteer for overtime, and so I start missing. And the next thing you know, because he's spending so much time with work, he, he, he's neglecting his family, and so the family comes apart, etc. Let's work our way through this section. This is quite familiar, and I'm going to pick up the pace just a little bit. He talks about contentment versus godliness now. Let's talk about contentment. In contrast to what he just said at verse 5, those who think that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And so if you really want to be rich, then uh, it comes with contentment and godliness. What is godliness, by the way? The Having to do with the fear of God, devout, piety before God. <clears throat> uh, verse 7 he talks about contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. Here's the reason that's the case. Verse 7, what's the reason? When, yeah, when you came to the world, when you came into this world, you didn't bring anything with you, and when you leave, you're not taking anything with you. So that tells me that all material things are nothing and they're temporary. And most temporary things we don't value a lot, do we? If, we, if, you, if you have something that's temporary, and this is not yours, you're not keeping it, it's just temporary, you don't value that a lot. And so that's the point, I think, that he's making. Now, verse 8, he tells us the degree of contentment. First of all, let's define contentment, then let's talk about the degree. How would you define the word content? What does it mean? Happy with the things you have? Yeah, the word is it literally translated satisfied, being satisfied with what we have that's the idea sufficient i have sufficient now to what degree should i be satisfied verse eight yeah having food and clothing that means i have the basic necessities of life i may not have the job i want i may not have the income that i want i may not drive the car i really want i may not have um the house i want is there anything wrong with wanting more in the sense that I strive, I'm going to get a better car that, that's more dependable, I'm going to get a bigger house to accommodate the family? Is there anything wrong with that? Say again. All right, not as long as you're devoted to God first. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Someone has said contentment has to do with losing desire for things beyond your reach. I like that definition. That it may be within my reach to get this bigger house because I need that for my, my larger family that I have now. 
Um, but if it's beyond my reach and I'm unhappy and I'm dissatisfied and I'm grumbling and complaining, I'm no longer content. Let's talk about riches. Verse 9, those who desire to be rich, what's the danger? Yeah, they fall into many uh, foolish and harmful lust, which bring men down to destruction and perdition. And here's why, because the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The New King James, perhaps uh, the rendering of that a little bit. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So he's just contrasting this content spirit with the idea of those who desire to be rich and they're craving for more and for more. For what it may be worth to us, there are three categories with reference to uh, uh, that are addressed with reference to riches. There are those that are rich, we'll get to later at verse 17, who really are rich, verse 17. There are those who desire to be rich, verse 9, and those who are really rich with reference to spirituality in verse 6. Make sense? Let's move on. Let's talk about this exhortation to Timothy. Uh, I word it this way because I built that off of, I built a sermon around this once about flee, follow, and fight. Uh, the American Standard uses the word follow instead of the word pursue here. So what does Paul tell Timothy to flee? Yeah, several things he talked about. What, what are some of the things he's talked about? All right, false doctrine is one. All right, how you treat... Sir, uh, What else? Love of money? Here we go. Here's what I'm looking for right here. False doctrine has just been dealt with at verse 3. Flee from that. The rejection of the, uh, the proud rejection of the word, flee from that. Envy, flee from that. Evil suspicions, love of money. Would it include any sin? Sure. And so what does the word flee mean? How would you define the word flee? Yeah, run away from. The Living Bible paraphrase says run from. One uh, lexicographer says uh, run as from a poisonous adder. Uh, you run from it like you're afraid of it. So you flee things, and when you flee from one thing, you automatically do what? Run to something else. So he says in the process, pursue after. And what do you pursue? Patience and gentleness, yes. Righteousness, being right with God, first and foremost. Godliness, being devoted to God. Faith, faith in God, faith in His Word. Loving God, loving mankind. Endurance and treating other people right would be involved in gentleness. Now the next thing he mentions is to fight. What is he to fight? Fight the good fight of faith. The fact that he calls it the good fight tells me there are some fights... They're not, say again, they're not good. Some fights are not good. If you ever see a good fight, get in it. Would you agree? Stand for what's right. That's what Paul told Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. And in so doing, he said, you lay hold on eternal life. Now, what else do you see in 12 to 16? There's several things there. We're going to call attention to uh, that as we go along. But what do you see in 12 to 16 about fighting the good fight? All right. All right. And perhaps even more so would be the contrast between that and disputing about uh, things that are uh, like at verse four over arguments over words. Uh, you're to fight the good fight. But don't waste your time arguing over things that don't matter. Does that make sense? Don't stir up issues that don't need to be stirred, but at the same time fight the good fight of faith. Look at verse 12. Uh, to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I take that to be the confession uh, mentioned in Hebrews 10, the confession of our faith. We make that as we become children of God. Our, our, but it is a profession, not just that I believe in Christ, but if you acknowledge Christ as the Son of God, you're, you're pledging to follow and, and uh, service unto to the Lord. And so hold to that confession that you've made. And then he identifies, 
And I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Uh, who has the English standard? Mark's not here. He's my English standard guy. Um, all right. While, while he's looking for it, I want you to hear the English standard, which I think clarifies verse 13. I think the point is this. Then we'll come back to the English standard at verse 13. That uh, Jesus made a confession before Pilate. And he was willing to die for that. So, so Timothy should live for his confession. Does it make sense? In light of the fact Jesus made a confession before Pilate and, and it cost him, you should be willing to make the same confession and you did and you live up to that confession. English standard, verse 13. Yeah, here we, in his testimony before Pontius Pilate, I don't think it's emphasizing that Jesus witnessed the confession as it is he made the confession before Pontius Pilate, that I am the Son of God. Make sense? And so just as he made the confession, and you live up to the confession that you've made. Uh, now verse 14, I'm going to mention quickly, and then go to uh, verse 16 that you keep this commandment without spot and blameless. That is the charge that's before you. You keep this commandment of holding to that confession, holding faithfully to that confession without spot. Now Jesus has identified verse 16 as who alone hath immortality. That's been abused by our, our uh, materialist. By materialist, I'm not talking about those interested in material things. Materialist is the one who denies the immort immortality of man. Man doesn't live on beyond the grave. We're, we're material. We're made up of flesh and blood, and that's it. Uh, so when you die, you, 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 there's nothing that lives beyond the grave. The Jehovah's Witness would fit that. And the argument is that God alone hath immortality. Man doesn't have it. That's not the argument that he's making. Um, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living. Remember the statement in Matthew? Um, so the point is that he only hath immortality, as American Standard renders it. He's not like man. I'm capable of dying, but I have a part of me that lives on. With, with deity, he's incapable of dying. Make sense? He only hath immortality. Now, Linsky and others have suggested that the point is this. It's not saying that others don't have immortality, but they depend their immortality upon the source who is Christ. He is the source of immortality. Does that make sense? Linsky makes a good argument for that. Patton does too. And you might consult those, those sources. Let's move on now to uh, question number seven. What do you learn about riches from 17 through 19? All right, don't put your trust in the material things. Say again. All right, be rich in good works. Don't put your trust in that. Let's work through this. Let's see what we've got. Three things on the screen. Uh, don't be high-minded. Charge those that are rich, command those that are rich in the present age not to be haughty. In other words, not, is there anything wrong with being rich? No, there's nothing wrong with that. There were rich people in the Bible. Abraham, who else was rich? Job was rich. Perhaps the apostle John was rich. Uh, Abraham was rich. Uh, uh, I think I already mentioned Abraham. Anyway, there were great Bible characters. Yes, ma'am. I think that it, it's important to notice that God is the one that gives us what we need. Uh, as God gives it, God gives us richly. Absolutely. So those who are, are rich, charge them not to be haughty, not to put their trust in riches. But here's a point I want you to notice, that God gave us all things to enjoy. What do you make of that? I have too. Not everybody enjoys their blessings. The more they're blessed with, the more they worry about. If you gave them a thousand dollars, that bothers them. If you gave them a hundred thousand, they're bothered more. And if you gave them a million, they're worried even more. Um, and they don't enjoy what they have. They can't enjoy. They they don't spend it even on good things, or they just, they just hold on to it because they're scared to death with their money. Say again. 
They're miserable. God gave us all things to enjoy. Now, verse 18, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, willing to give, willing to share. The American Standard says communicate, having to do with fellowship. You share with others. Uh, and when they do, verse 19, what are they doing? Laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. So here are those that are rich. Uh, let's get this last section. Here's his final charge as he winds this up. Now, he's not through writing to Timothy because we've got 2 Timothy to go that we're going to get to. But he said, Timothy, do this. Guard what is committed to your trust. What does that mean? What's been committed to his trust? The Word of God, the Gospel. Guard it. Protect it. Uh, you are steward of that. It's not yours. You're protecting that, so, so guard it carefully. As a Bible class teacher uh, or teaching your children or talking to your neighbor, you are charged to guard it and protect it. That's not your gospel. It belongs to someone else. You guard it and make sure you use it carefully. Guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. We've already talked about in contradictions of what is falsely called science, King James, or knowledge. I think probably a reference to the Gnostic thought that we talked about here a few weeks ago uh, in the sermon. Uh, but that the, the avoid the, the disputes that, are, that accomplish nothing, the vain or empty, notice the empty uh, chatter that, that when you get through, there's, nothing, there's no substance to it. Uh, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith, and then he says, grace be to you. It's interesting he ends on this note, be careful to avoid all this emptiness and chatter and uh, false knowledge, etc., and then kind of yours truly. <laughs> He's done. He ends on that note. Questions or comments? Time is gone. I wanted to say more about that, but that's... Some of these verses 3 of people that say there's a difference between doctrine and doctrine. We see in verse 3 that it, it, uh, kind of ties it together and makes both equally important. Yes, I, I think so because it, it's the words of the Lord Jesus and that's doctrine and it's according to godliness. There are probably passages that make that case stronger, but it, 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 I think that passage could be used. Questions or comments? Chapter 6, or on 1 Timothy. Instructions to Timothy of what he's to teach, how he's to teach, how he's to conduct himself. And so next time we'll deal with uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. We've got time maybe for one practical lesson or two. Something you learned from this chapter. What did you learn? All right. Dependency upon God and God's in control. We'll end on that note. Next time, we'll look at 2 Timothy chapter 1.